Without any further of my ranting on stage, please give a Shmoocon 2020 welcome to Moose. Thank you so much, uh, short people problems. So um, thank you for coming today. Um, this is Choose Your Own Adventure Ransomware Response, um, the game where no one sleeps and good backups are your best friend. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a different talk in that, and, and bear with me because the words I'm about to say are kind of scary. I'm going to rely on some audience participation. All you have to do is raise your hand. So there's voting, and I know that this community has a lot of opinions, so we shouldn't have a problem. Um, what this talk is is more of a framework for incident response for ransomware. It is not a how-to guide, so it is very high level. Oh my god. <laughs> it's very high level. Good, it's a shield. Um, <laughs> So this is a very high level approach. There are different outcomes we can come to and no outcome is the same. So um, the least important slide in this presentation is who I am. Uh, I go by Moose. Um, on the uh, schedule, I believe I am Docs. My name is also Heather. Um, call me whatever you want, I'll probably answer to it. I do DFIR by day, um, so incident response. I, I eat, sleep, and breathe it. Um, I love logs. Uh, I've written a lot of reports. And I work for everybody and nobody. I am here representing uh, no employer, so anything I say is my, my own opinion. Please don't contact the lawyers that I work for. All right. So uh, like any good adventure, we're going to get started with, uh, with story time. Uh, once upon a time, there was an enterprise environment. And this starts at 5.01 PM on a Friday, uh, because you can't. <laughs> You can't spell DF, uh, Friday without DFIR. Uh, you can actually check that. It's, it's right there in the word. Um, so uh, I am a nerd. 300 Windows 12, 2012 servers for the Elven admins deployed on the cloud. 700 Linux servers for the dwarf admins in their halls of dusty cubicles. 9,000 Windows 7 workstations for mortal men doomed to an open office. One Mac for the CEO and their executive suite in the corporation of Mordor where the vulnerabilities lie. One ransomware EXE to rule them all, one security oversight to find them, one encryption key to bring them all and in the war room bind them, in the corporation of Mordor where the vulnerabilities lie. Bad jokes. Things are going to be flying at my head. It's going to keep going. <laughs> I'm glad you all have bad aim. Um, so the first thing we do when, when there's uh, an investigation for incident response, either you work at the company or somebody calls you, um, but usually it's, it's somebody in charge and, and they're, they're slightly panicked. Um, it's never a good feeling, and you have to calm that down. So really, the, the first part of this is, is always going to be the same. You have to scope. Scoping is so, so important. Um, first question I usually ask is, is there going to be legal involvement? Um, the answer is usually yes in some way, shape, or form, or there should be. Uh, CYA, uh, we all know what that stands for. Um, you want to know what the impact is right now. So what's been seen, what's the, the earliest that it was seen, what's happening right now, what's down, what's not down, where, where are we standing right now, what's already been done. Make notes of it, make timestamps of, of when it's been done, um, and what's to do. So start creating your plan early. Uh, what's the current state of the environment? Uh, already kind of stated that, but also, you know, what's not accounted for? Have we taken a look at everything? Um, you know, who's being affected? Um, are there sensitive systems and sensitive information that we need to prioritize first? Uh, what's the desired outcome? Um, so do we just want to know who it is? Do we want to know how they got in? Do we want to know if just a particular database was touched? Know early on what your goals are so that you can stick to them and drive people back to those goals. Um, and then you want to get visibility. So as early as you can, you want eyes on your problem um, and spread out as far and wide as you possibly can. And then establish points of contact and responsibilities. If you're all running in the same direction, you're going to get nowhere fast. So delegate. Um, so we found a ransomware artifact. 
Now we vote. What did we find? Did you find a Ryu Ransom note? Did you find a Globe imposter executable? Or did you find Gab Gancrab unpaid invoice 69.bbs? Can I see A? Raise your hands. A. B. Raise your hands. C. Raise your hands. Oh. I see what you guys like. All right. Unpo unpaid invoice 69. Let's see what this is. All right, Gancrab, are you sure? So, the IT, the fellowship of the IT has found a note threatening a user. It includes an image of your coworker seen here. Um, they say that they found your coworker watching porn and they're demanding money for this image. This is not Gancrab. But the naming mechanism of the note threw off the team. This is an extortion campaign, but it's not considered something that would impact your company. You get HR involved and try to forget that attached photo of your coworker, not in business casual. Um, so some notes here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know ransomware too well going into it if you get hit by something. Um, but if you start to look up Gancrab, the group actually retired in May 2019. Um, so they're no longer in operation anymore at least as Gancrab. There's some speculation that they've moved on to other things, um, but the, the note here is beware of prior di diagnosis. Your team might tell you or a SOC might escalate to you and say, hey, we found this thing, we know it's this. Investigate, analyze, check your hashes, see if it's actually the thing they're saying it is. So, dead end, game over. Shortest talk ever, right guys? Um, <laughs> I love that I'm short. <laughs> I'm just going to get lower. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll vote again. We found a ransomware artifact. Is it a Ryuk ransom note or Globe Imposter executable? Let me see A. 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 OK, let me see B. A wins. All right, so we're looking at Ryuk today. We found a Ryuk ransom note. The client's IT team has correctly identified a Ryuk artifact. It is the readme.html. This is very common. This is usually the, the correct naming mechanism for what it drops. Uh, you go and look at it. Uh, it is associated with the user Smeagol. You take note of that. Um, and it's time to collect more evidence. So you notice that this user account is there. You ask them, is this the absolute earliest thing you saw? They say yes. OK. So I've noted on here we want a PST for the user Smeagol. That's just the file type because you know that they use uh, Microsoft Office and, and Outlook. And so you want the Outlook mailbox for user Smeagol. And why might that be? Well, we think could have come in in a few different ways, but knowing Ryuk probably came in in a fish. So we want to check that out. Um, and we want to preserve that artifact just as soon as possible. We also have a handy dandy forensic artifact collection script because we do this all the time. Um, so we ask, hey, can we push out our collection tool, 11zscollection.exe, to your entire environment? The more, the better. We want complete visibility. And so this is a little bit faster than pulling full disks on every machine. So say that we have, I think at the beginning, we, we say we have a couple thousand. We, we're not going to image every single machine. But we want visibility. So let's go ahead and push that out there um, and get, get eyes on everything. Um, we do know that this is the earliest thing we saw and it is on a user's machine. So we do want the full disk of that machine. So let's go ahead and collect that. And you know, just for funsies, uh, we know that you have firewall logs. We think you do. Let's get those too. We love logs. So what do you actually get? You've asked for everything under the sun. Is this reality? No. So next voting round, you can have one. So you get the collection script successfully run across the environment. You get Smeagol's PST. You don't get any firewall logs, and you get no full disk images. Second choice, no collection script. It's too risky. Your CISO just won't allow it. You can have one full disk image, I guess, and the Smeagol PST file. And sure, here, have some firewall logs. Third option. We ran the collection script, but about 25% were left off. We don't know why. No, you can't have them. Uh, we did yank seven disks for you. We panicked. We don't know which one patient zero is, but here are seven disks. 
There you go. Um, we have a random uh, MFT for you, so master file table from a Windows device. Uh, we just SFTP'd it over. I don't actually know where it came from. Uh, we have firewall logs for you, but uh, sorry about that mailbox. We don't back anything up. So let me see hands for A. A. B. Oh, a lot of Bs. OK, C. C. <laughs> All right, A's revote. B. B, 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 C. Yeah. God, you guys are noisy. OK, C's win, even though the room split, because they're noisy. So oh, yes, this is correct. Uh, so you got data from the forensics collector. You got about 75%. So you search your data, and you start to see things come up. What is this? Under user Smeagol, you see some curious DLLs. You see inject DLL64, network DLL64, pwgrab64. Uh, what could these be? So smells like TrickBot. Uh, we don't see the TrickBot executable, but we do see the modules associated. And TrickBot has several more. This is just a smattering. The really nasty one that's in there here is that inject DLL64. So what that does. Uh, is it will run a collection script. It usually has a C2 in it to beacon back out, um, and it will help propagate uh, and, and help drop that ransomware. So a lot of times when we see Ryuk, we see one of two things. Uh, we might see Emotet or we might see TrickBot, but most of the time you'll see this scattered throughout the environment, um, or at least on one or two boxes as part of the mechanism for propagation. Um, in this case, we see three modules with it. Network DLL64, they've come in, they've started doing the network topology for your environment, so they probably know how things are structured and everything's connected together. Uh, fun fact, most environments are not segmented, so you're looking at a flat network anyways. Just, just an interesting assumption that one might be able to make. It is funny because it's true. It also hurts. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and then the third one we see on there was something that was introduced later in TrickBot. And when I say later, uh, I want to say 2018. Don't quote me on that. I'm being recorded. I shouldn't say this. Um, I don't know when it was introduced, but it was a little later, and it's the password grabber. So um, it is a module that will go in and try and, and get passwords and exfil those. So it smells like TrickBot. We also want to take a look at that random MFT. What the heck did they SFTP to us? Um, so we're looking at it, and lo and behold, we see mimicats.exe mounted to the path E. What is that? The creation timestamp of it is about 10 hours after TrickBot, so that's interesting. And when you ask what the MFT belonged to, they tell you, oh, oh, that was our domain controller. Oh, some of you know where this is going. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One cannot simply, oh, wait, yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> all right. So next step, we have these TrickBot DLLs, right? We want to see where that C2 is going, because we think maybe the inject64 DLL, maybe that has the C2 in it. It's got to have some kind of communication. Uh, but they're encrypted. So I can't look at those. Thankfully, you did ask for those firewall logs, and you see them. So you check for port 3389, which is RDP. And you want to see if there's remote traffic going in that's non-local IPs, so anything non-RFC 1918 that's going to be anything external to your environment. Uh, did I not write that correctly? I didn't. <laughs> you see some. Wait. And see that there are a few events. I did write that correctly. I can't read, and I have had Red Bull beer and water now, so we're doing good. Um, so you do see a few. Um, and you go, huh, that's, that's suspicious. What is this IP and what is it doing? Did it do anything? So this is not a choice. <laughs> there would have been a choice. And you can see that there would have been a choice if we would have gotten a full disk image. We did not. Uh, <laughs> wait, did we? No, we did not. Um, we noticed that there is a strange RDP login event uh, for 4624 type 10. 
from a Tor exit node in the Netherlands soon after TrickBot was dropped. The username is not Schmeagel. The username is Galadria Admin. So, you have this strange RDP login event, and you have the, the username is Galadria Admin. Uh, this isn't the user we thought was compromised, guys. Uh, but we did see the password stealing DLL for Drickbot, and we saw Mimikatz. So, this is probably not only directly resultant of Smeagol's click, uh, but you see the threat actor is escalating admin privilege in there to, to establish persistence. This may have been what got the Mimikatz onto our share on a domain controller, which I don't know why the share was on the domain controller, but you know. So, it is threat actor eviction day. There are things that we didn't see, and in fact, I think I need to go back to my slide deck because I'm missing one. So there are literally like 46 slides in this deck and I kind of chained them together and it's working so far, but I'm pretty sure I missed a step. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, but we're, we're gonna kick them out right now because we know a couple things happened, right? So Mimi Cats did happen, we saw it. Uh, we, may, we might have checked back in a shim cache uh, and the amcache file, so what's important there? Okay, shim cache is gonna tell us when it last executed. We know that this last executed after our Ryuk dropped, so we can confirm that. We know that this happened within the scope of our investigation. Amcache, we look for the SHA-1 and confirm. It is indeed Mimikatz and somebody has not gotten clever and renamed an executable like Winward. Um, so that ran. Um, we did see this very curious exit tour node communicating. So we're gonna say, no more RDP open to the world, what are you doing? Now, some businesses need to have RDP open and you need to remote in to certain machines. But, do you need to remote in to all your machines from everywhere? Yes. Probably oh. not. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> 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 the answer is not yes. Um, so because we did see Mimi Cat's run, uh, the next thing, and this is the hill I'm gonna die on today, um, who knows about Golden Ticket by show of hands? A good amount of you, excellent. So I'm gonna go briefly into Golden Ticket and what that means. We have Mimi Cat's run, and that's important because we use Kerberos tokens for authentication. Uh, it basically gives me a golden pass into anywhere on the network and anywhere in your infrastructure that I want to go and I can run amok and do anything I want because I have all your tokens. Uh, so it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like your favorite day at Chuck E. Cheese as a kid. Um, so this is happening um, and so what, what do you do about it? Uh, you would think that maybe you just roll your tokens uh, reset all of your username and passwords, all of your systems accounts. And this is what most people do. So please don't fault anybody who, know, who doesn't know about this next trick. You have to double tap KRBTGT, and that's the ticket process. And the reason is, is because Microsoft created a credential cache with the tokens. Um, and so if you have one token, you also have an expired token that's right behind it. You have two tokens that you can play with. And you reset one, but if you don't reset both of them, then the threat actor can come back in and use that cached credential and maintain that persistence in your environment. There is a 10 hour cycle time. And the reason that this is important is so that you don't become the threat actor as IT admin, and let me explain this real quick because this gets real fun. Um, so, in all the infinite wisdom that is computers, uh, you don't want something cycling, say, every five seconds because that could take stuff down too, right? So, knowing that environments come in small, medium, large, and extra huge, um, there's a default cycle time on Kerberos uh, tokens. And that default time is 10 hours, and most people, not knowing about the cycle time or not caring, leave it set at 10 hours. So whenever I give this recommendation of double tap um, KRB TGT, I always say, wait 10 hours. Well, doesn't that introduce risk? I suppose, maybe, but you can do two things about that. 
you can monitor for an event code 4769, and it's got a little tag on it, 0x1f. And that could be somebody trying to reauth and getting a failure message for a ticket that's expired. So that might create a red flag for you right away. But if you double tap right away, what it's going to do is create a whole bunch of those 4769 events and create a whole ton of noise and take things down. So the reason you want to wait the whole cycle time is because it needs to cycle through and do that reset rather than force it. So about 10 hours. Uh, if you're at 1001, nothing's going to break. Um, so that's, that's one of the steps we're going to take. The other thing we want to do is we want to start hardening firewall rules. So the very important thing about the scenario you chose, and I think the slide that was missing, did we say that we were going to get seven images, seven, seven full disks? We did, didn't we? There is a slide missing. I'll go back to it, I promise. Uh, so about those seven disks, uh, you might be wondering. So they did pull them for you. Uh, they're there. You have them. And when you stuck FTK up to them, they started beeping at you. <laughs> what does that mean? This is a great question, because I said that too when this happened to me. Um, <laughs> it means that they don't work. Um, and when you, or say me, or somebody that shall not be named, uh, tried to put them in another box to see if you could mount them and get them to boot and read, that didn't work either. So these might have come from a RAID device, and when we say they got yanked in panic, well, oh yes. So incident response is hard. <laughs> Security is hard. Be kind to your admins, because things happen uh, like that. And this might have happened more than once in multiple cases. and. Um, yeah, so if you're listening to this streaming and for whatever reason you recognize my face or my name, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> That's my disclaimer. <laughs> it happens to everybody. Don't worry about it. Um, have backups. Uh, so the next thing you want to do is harden your firewall rules. Um, what is a way we can do this, red teamers? Anybody? Anybody? Nmap? Anybody? Nmap, uh, Nmap, scan your stuff. Uh, figure out what's listening, what's not. Like, look at it. So they got in via RDP, but what says that it's not going to be SSH next time or some kind of other weird crap? So if you have everything open to the world, oh, don't say Telnet. <laughs> <laughs> that just hurts me, um, and it does happen. Uh, so you know, you you want to look at what else you have out there. Um, the the unfortunate thing is the reason we see so much RDP. Um, is because it is low-hanging fruit, and it still just works. So why would you try extra if it's just going to work? So uh, you see a lot of RDP spamming out there still and brute forcing um, just because it's not probably being monitored properly. So get the monitoring in place. Uh, make sure that any machine that doesn't need those listening ports, go ahead and cut them off um, and, and do a scan to see what's, what's happening there. There are also some firewalls. Uh, I'm not going to name names where the default setting on a firewall is to send a TCP reset flag when you're blocking traffic rather than cleanly drop it. Be very, very aware of this. Because the difference there is, uh, um, <clears throat> well, I'll give an example. So somebody knocks at your door, and you're an introvert because you work in security, <laughs> and you don't want to answer it. So what do you do? Right, so you don't say anything. But the equivalent of sending the TCP reset is nobody's home. There's somebody in there. So you're waving and saying, hey, there's a thing you can hit here, but you missed. Try again. <laughs> So go ahead and cleanly drop traffic wherever you can. Um, obviously, you don't want to do this on things where there's a lot of misconfiguration or you, you get that kind of traffic where you're not trying to block it. Um, but if you have rules like, say, against China Chopper or something that's well known that has those signatures out there that you know, hey, if this comes in, it's bad, uh, do a cleanly drop. Um, and then the last one, we didn't get that PST for Schmeagel. Oh, sad. Uh, there might have been something in there. Probably was. Uh, but we learned while we were talking to them that, shock and awe, 
there was no two-factor or multi-factor authentication set up for them on their Outlook. So, and, and they use OWA. So go ahead and get them set up for that. Really push for that because if you've got persistence in an environment um, and there's not uh, multi-factor authentication, it just makes the, the threat actor's job easier to stay in longer. Um, and you know, that gets expensive. So we have walked through one scenario. The possible outcomes we could have come to today were 22. And I'm gonna like pause for a second on that because it took me a really long time to write all of these linking slides and we only went through a few. And what I really want the impact to be is that there's a huge difference depending on the environment, depending on what kind of uh, evidence you get back, depending on what you see, will be wi widely variable in what the threat actor activity is and what the conclusions of your investigation are and what you put in a report. Um, the difference in response actions when I wrote this, that end slide we just walked through, almost identical across the board, even with Globe and Pasta ransomware. Um, and the reason for that is, and the reason that's important, you will almost never see the same case twice response is fluid, um, but your best practice for remediation a lot of times is very similar. And that best practice for remediation can be used and turned on its head for the best practice of not getting hit in the first place. So if you take this now and take it back as if, I don't know, you had done a pen test for this, and had results and took those steps uh, and proved that you had those vulnerabilities, uh, you could use it as a preventative rather than reacting in time, which is very, very expensive. Um, and the awareness to your blind spots is crucial. Like, I don't know, missing an entire slide out of your presentation. Um, <laughs> but no, we, we know that we didn't collect for 25% of machines uh, that were out there for our collection scripts. So we have no idea what happened with those. We don't know if there's Emotet as well as TrickBot out there because we didn't have that. We can't confirm that Rio came in uh, via RDP. We didn't really see any brute forcing, so probably not. We know it originated with Schmeagle, but we have no PST. So even though we think, hey, you probably got fished. We don't have ground to stand on. So setting up the organization to collect those in the future so you have them is very, very important. Um, and that is essentially uh, incident response for ransomware. Um, thank you. I have a few special thanks before I do something weird and go back in my slide deck and show you kind of the, the secrets. Um, also, I see people moving, so I have this. <laughs> Not, don't go for the head. Uh, <laughs> so I do want to thank uh, a couple people. Uh, Mariah's in the front row. I'm going to call her out. Uh, I was going to try and do this with 46 slides and a sheet of paper next to me that said, if they choose this, go to this slide and manually go to it. There's linking in PowerPoint, everybody. Uh, <laughs> she saved my life. She also got me this handy dandy tennis racket. So if you guys throw anything at my head, like that one, uh, you know, I can maybe hit it, but I'm not good at team sports. So there's that. Um, uh, noise, Mr. Bot, Ophir, Fun Size, all four of these people have been bugging me since May to give this talk. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, my anxiety has never been so high. Um, meme help. Uh, I did have a couple people on lovely Twitter who uh, did, uh, did alter that Gandalf photo because I suck at Photoshop. Um, and for sanity checking, I did reference bleeping computer CrowdStrike and malware bytes just to get dates right and make sure that I had uh, the most current attack mechanisms. So um, I am going to do a thing now where I ask if anybody has any questions. But I also want to find this other slide that I really liked um, about those seven disks. Uh, and you're going to see, oh, maybe you can't see it. Okay, 
Never mind. You won't see me go through my mess. Excellent. Um, I watched you just walk in. Shame. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's the slide. Yeah. Oh. What happened? I apparently didn't make enough sacrifices to the demo gods. Uh, <laughs> next, qu next question. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, one of the reasons, great question, can we go through the rest of the slide deck uh, and see the different scenarios? So, I'm going to go ahead and say two things about that. One, there's no way I have the time for that, and I'll probably get yelled at. And two, one of the reasons I spent so long and tortured myself with 46 slides and 22 different outcomes is I have a personal rule for myself. I never give the same talk twice, and I knew this was being recorded. I would like to be lazy next time and give a different talk. And so part of this is it's recyclable. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, if you would like to, you can watch the next iteration of this in which I make it better and hopefully this slide works, uh, in which everybody's face palming and you get no discs. And apparently you get no slide either because that's what we have. So, yes. You partially answered my question. So this is a trilogy, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if I'm really good about it, it will be a trilogy and then a one part in three parts. Uh, and I'll extend it even further. <laughs> Oh, oh, two nerds. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on what you choose. Hey, thank you. <laughs> and that's why you should always be kind to your admins. Uh, <laughs> What does your collection script pull? Well, um, I like to see Shimcash and Amcash, so I want to pull those across the environment. I do want MFT um, on things. I do want to see PowerShell events if it's happening. I want to see WMI if it's happening. Um, and, and actually, that's something we didn't go into and is very important, and that's why I said this is a framework, not reality. So these take weeks-ish maybe days, weeks-ish to do to a full investigation and dig down to the bottom because the first thing you find is not the where you should stop. Um, you want to see persistence and hands on keyboard. A lot of what we're seeing with uh, ransomware attacks and persistence and environments are running in PowerShell or WMI or both. Uh, and so getting that information uh, and monitoring it closely and seeing what's expected versus what's not and maybe telling your admins to stop using PS exec so that you can actually see stuff. Um, you know, that's, that's something that, uh, that you would want to see. Uh, let me think of what else. Um, on the spot. There are some scripts that you can pull from, I think, on GitHub that are collection scripts and you can modify them. I recommend going on there and doing some research and kind of building your own, um, but there are some that are already in existence. Uh, a lot of them are based in PowerShell. Good question. Anybody else? Speak now or forever hold your schmoo balls. All right, no, 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 no. That was not an invitation. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.